Well, friends, will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for those precious truths that we just sang. Rehearsing and reminding ourselves of the gospel message of our salvation, the great hope that we have in and through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have been merciful to us, that you sent your son, Jesus, to come into the world to save sinners like us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your work in and through your son, Jesus, his death on our behalf his resurrection to give us life, his coming again, the hope that we have. We long for one day to see you face to face, God. I pray that you would strengthen us as we walk on this journey in this life with whatever we face, all of the sufferings, all of the difficulties, as we wrestle with remaining sin and the presence of sin, Lord. We long for that day when we will sing before your throne and see your face. We long for you, God. We love you, God. Thank you for first loving us. And so, God, as we come to your word, right now I proclaim that I believe in the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you help me as I preach? Would you help us as we sit under your word that you would illuminate it, illuminate our hearts and our minds by the power of your Spirit, that we would be able to see it and understand it and receive it in our hearts and hold fast to it and to do it and to live it out in our life. And so, God, would you help me? May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Open our eyes. Open our ears. Prepare our hearts to receive all of your wonderful truth. And we pray this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing our series in 1 Timothy. So if you have a Bible, I just want to invite you to turn there, the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 2. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Dan preached and finished out chapter 1. And I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to seven. Hear God's word. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is God's word, amen, amen. Well, a chiropractor is defined in a dictionary as this, a practitioner of the system of integrative medicine based on the diagnosis and manipulative treatment of misalignments of the joints. So what does a chiropractor do? It seeks to bring health to the body by treating that which is misaligned. So when things in the body are misaligned, the body experiences pain. So too in the body of Christ. From its teachings, to its practices, to its relationships with one another, and to its relationship with the world, When the body of Christ lacks proper alignment, it lacks health, and it experiences pain. So in 1 Timothy, Paul, in essence, is seeking to treat the misalignments in the church body. What Paul is after, he's he's after long-term health. Long-term health. He wants the body to be realigned so that it flourishes with one another internally and has external effectiveness in the world. 
So this church that, that Paul is, is commending Timothy to then work in and through, this church faced false doctrine, and it was taught by those who were swerving from the truth. And if we were to read the whole letter, we would see that the impact of this false teaching, it comes in a variety of ways. It was division, controversy, speculations, skepticism within the church, friction, envy, fighting, and slandering, as the whole letter will describe. So the presence of this false teaching, the impact of it is that many were actually stirred up to fall away or swerve from the faith. And even Pastor Dan preached on last time that Hymenaeus and Alexander, that Paul removed them from their position and their post for not holding fast to the true gospel at the end of chapter 1. Paul wanted to realign the church body. He's after long-term health for the church, and he's anchoring them in gospel truth, gospel doctrine, and he's realigning the practices of the church under godly leadership. So unhealthy teaching, what did that lead to? That led to divisions and people falling away and straying from the church. But Paul's aims are completely opposite to that. Paul's teaching is to bring unity to the church and actually to welcome new people into the church, not for people to be falling away. So as he seeks to realign the church, Paul starts with prayer. First of all, then, he says, first of all, Paul wants to realign the prayers of the church for greater health in the church and for greater effectiveness in witness. So college church, we want to be a healthy church for the long haul. We must align our prayers with God's purposes. If we want to be a healthy church for the long haul, not just looking back at what God has done at College Church over the last 150 so years, but if we want to look forward and be a healthy church for the long haul, we must align our prayers with God's purposes. Sounds simple enough, right? Our prayers, God's purposes. Not always so simple. <laughs> If we're honest, we, we struggle to be a praying people in the first place, don't we? Prayer can be hard. Didn't the disciples themselves ask, Lord, teach us how to pray? The disciples thought that prayer was hard. And if I'm being honest, so do I. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I found myself sitting with some of the pastors around a table sharing an update about my own ministry and my own life. And I articulated a, a wrestle and a struggle in my own prayer life, a rushed prayer life, an inconsistent prayer life, an area of growth in my own heart and life. Prayer can be hard. I wonder if you can relate. But maybe for some of you, the, the prayer part is actually not the difficult part. That's not the issue for you. What about God's purposes? How often are the prayers in which you offer to God aligned with God's purposes beyond yourself? Our prayers can lose focus. The global eternal purposes of God can quickly fade from our view, and we can easily forget the heart and the purposes of God. So think about this with me for a moment. When, when we read in the Bible big moments and big movements, they are actually often preceded by prayer. Luke highlights this often in his gospel and in the book of Acts. So think about, before the identity of Jesus is declared at his baptism, Jesus was found praying. Before the identity of Jesus was declared from the lips of Peter, Jesus was found praying. Before Jesus was transfigured on the mountain and a voice from heaven came and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, declaring the identity of Jesus. Before that, Jesus was found praying. Before the spirit was poured out at Pentecost and the mission took off, the church was found praying. As the church was declaring the gospel and opposition came on all sides, the church huddled together and gathered and prayed. When Cornelius 
heard the gospel. Before that, Cornelius, who was a Gentile, he was found praying. And not only Cornelius, but Peter was found praying before this happened. Before the first missionary sent out from the church of Antioch, the church was gathered together and they were found praying. Big moments and big movements in the mission of God, they come often on the heels of a church that is gathered praying. So Paul is wanting to bring health to the church to align the prayers of the church with the purposes of God, and that means we need to align ourselves in the very same way. So we want to be a healthy church. We must align our prayers with God's purposes. Prayer is hard. We can lose focus in our prayers, but Paul is going to teach us and realign us tonight. He's going to enlarge our vision of God and his purposes in the world. And so we'll do that with two movements, our prayers and God's purposes. And Paul is really aiming at what Dr. Phil Riken called evangelistic prayers. Our evangelistic prayers as a church because of God's evangelistic purposes in the world. So first things first, look at verse 1 with me, our prayers. Paul urges the church to devote themselves to corporate prayer, first of all. I wonder, where, where does prayer rank in your priorities for the activities of the church? You see, on paper, it wouldn't be hard to say that prayer and proclamation would be the core engines of the church, but what about in practice? <laughs> Maybe some of the unhealth in our own spiritual life is because we don't have a first of all prayer instinct. Maybe some of the unhealth in our spiritual communities is because we don't have a first of all prayer priority. And maybe some of the challenges that we see as a church, it's because we don't have a first of all prayer priority. First of all, pray. So big decisions in our lives as a church, first of all, pray. Big plans, big movements, first of all, pray. Paul is going to focus us on, on what we're to pray for, who we're to pray for, why we're to pray for, but we should ask this question. Do we have this instinct? First of all, pray. That's what Paul is urging of the church and even us tonight. So first of all then, College Church, we ought to be a praying church. But how? He lays it out in this way. All kinds of prayers for all kinds of people, for all kinds of flourishing. Look at verse 1 with me. He says all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people. And he lays it out with supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. One commentator, George Knight, he, he notes this in kind of defining and describing the nuances in these prayers. Supplications, what are they? They're, they're requests for the specific needs in the lives of others. And prayers, it's, it's this, this sense of, of bringing others be, before God, bringing them wholly and completely to God. The intercessions, it's this appealing to God on someone's behalf. And then the thanksgivings is this gratitude to God for others. So Paul is saying these, these bold requests, these appeals, these earnest appeals, joyful thanksgivings of the people of God to God in prayer on behalf of others for their ultimate good. And as we're going to see in, in a moment, the ultimate good in Paul's mind and God's heart is eternal salvation. So all kinds of prayers that we're to offer to the living God. But who are we to pray for? All kinds of people. All kinds of people, including kings, including rulers, including influential people in authority. All kinds of people. No division, no partiality, no one left out. All kinds of people. You remember that list in chapter 1, verse 9 through 10? of 1 Timothy. What about the lawless and disobedient? Well, even for those types of people. Or the ungodly and the sinners, even them, 
the unholy and the profane, the angry, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the enslavers, the liars, even them, all kinds of people. We should pray, not just with those or for those that we agree with or those that we get along with or those that we like or those that we look like. We should be praying for all kinds and all types of people, those who are spiritually different than us, socially different than us, ethnically different than us, economically different. And even in Paul's mind, this includes political leaders, social authorities, even them, all kinds of people we are to pray for. Now, to those who get overwhelmed with prayer lists, (laughs) Paul is not asking for a strict list of seven billion people that we need to be praying for. (laughs) Paul is talking about all people, meaning all without distinction, not excluding a certain type of person. Now, what Paul might be doing, he may be correcting some of the impact of false teaching that that could have excluded people, could have been excluding Gentiles, some form of Jewish legalistic teaching or religion. Paul doesn't really specify for us in this letter with too much specificity. He simply says, all people. So all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people including the political and social authorities of his day and even our day. But why? For all kinds of flourishing. Look at verse 2. All kinds of flourishing. He says, For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. All kinds of flourishing. Philip Jensen, he wrote that, Paul focuses our prayers to include rulers and influencers because they have the ability to facilitate or to frustrate a kind of gospel living that's conducive to gospel advancement. So those who are in authority, rulers, those who are in in positions of of influence, that they actually have capacity to, to either facilitate or to frustrate a certain type of living that's conducive for the gospel to be spoken and proclaimed out in the world. Now we know that the gospel can never be stopped Regardless of the hostile environment or regardless of the harmless environment, the gospel is going out into the world. And yet we, we, we must say then and even now that there are still closed countries where there is not an open proclamation of the gospel. That there are political leaders and religious authorities, their social situations that are constantly seeking to frustrate the easy access of gospel teaching. And so what is Paul urging the church to do? He's urging them to pray for the political, the social, the vocational authorities to lead in such a way in which there's an environment that is flourishing and in such a way where the gospel living can be lived out in such a way that that would lead to more gospel speaking and people coming to know Jesus Christ. But we also know that ultimately all kings, all kingdoms are under the sovereign hand of the king of the ages, the immortal, the invisible, the only God. Do you remember Jesus' interaction with his local authority of the day, Pilate? John chapter 9, Pilate says, do you not know I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? How did Jesus answer? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. So when we are praying, our prayers come to the sovereign ears of a sovereign God who has a sovereign hand who is raising up leaders and bringing them down. And he's been doing that through all time. And we pray to that kind of God who has power to work in and through those in authority and those who are over us. And so we're urged to pray to this type of God for the authorities to cultivate an environment that's conducive to gospel advancement, this flourishing environment. Do you see that in verse 2? A peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, or in all godliness and dignity. This is a flourishing environment. 
It's conducive to gospel living so that there can be more gospel speaking. What will that look like? It's peaceful and it's quiet. People will not be in an uproar. There will not be constant frustrations. There's not going to be dominant barriers. What Paul is not calling for, he's not just calling for this comfortable American dream. He's not calling for that. But he's, he's longing for an environment that will facilitate gospel living and spur on gospel speaking. What is this gospel living described as? Well, he says it's godly and dignified. Godly, it's, it's the outworking of one's faith in Jesus. It's Christianity lived out on the ground level. Dignify, that, that, that means that Christians will have a weight of character in their community, a respect that is acknowledged by those that are around them. This is all kinds of flourishing. This environment that's facilitated by authorities in which the gospel living and gospel speaking is not resisted. That's what Paul is longing for. That's what Paul wants because he wants the gospel to continue to go out. College church, this, this should fill our prayer list. All kinds of prayers for all kinds of people, for all kinds of flourishing that will spur on gospel living so that more people will hear gospel speaking and gospel teaching and the gospel will go out. Paul teaches us that as we are doing this, as we're praying in this way along these lines, it's good and it's pleasing to God. In essence, God welcomes it. He invites it. He smiles upon it. It's good. Why, why is this good? Well, as he tells us in verse 3, it reflects the very heart of God, our Savior, and his desire for all people to be saved. You see, the prayers for a healthy and flourishing society, that is not an end in and of itself. The ultimate aim is salvation. God wants all kinds of people to be saved. And this happens through a knowledge of the truth when the gospel is proclaimed and it is received. Now let's pause for a moment. How are we to understand God's desire or, or God's will for all people to be saved? Now there's theological complexities. This language is, is stirring up in us as we're trying to process who God is and his activity in the world. We think of his sovereignty in salvation, and yet his desire for all to be saved. And yet, as we'll read in just a moment, there's only one way to salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, what this is not teaching, this is not teaching what some say is universalism. The testimony of the Bible rejects that. Universalism being that all people, regardless, will be saved in the end. It doesn't matter. All people will be saved. The Bible clearly teaches against that. So how have many tried to, to wrestle with this and articulate this? Well, some have tried to articulate an understanding and the differences between the moral will of God and the providential will of God, meaning God's moral will, his revealed will of command that humanity can reject, or God's providential will, his secret sovereign plan that only he knows in which he is working out according to his eternal purposes and according to his eternal will. And while I think that distinction has many merits, it's worth our consideration and even worth our conversation throughout, even after this time, I do believe Paul has a, a clearer intention in mind for us. With the language that's been used throughout the sermon, I believe Paul is speaking about all, meaning all without distinction not all without exception. All without exception is universalism, and the Bible rejects that. Paul is arguing for all without distinction. It's not just the Jews only, but it's even for the Gentiles, as, as Paul even says that he's a preacher to the Gentiles in verse 7. It's all without distinction, all without preference, available to all, not available to some. All kinds of people, not some kinds of people. Kings in the high ups and the blue collars in the low downs, all kinds of backgrounds, all who come to a knowledge of God 
through the gospel will be saved and know the life-changing mercy of God. This is what Paul is urging us to. He's urging us to offer to God evangelistic prayers. Evangelistic prayers that are pleasing to God and reflect the heart of God. So we want to be a healthy church. We need to align our prayers with God's purposes. So we've got to think just for a moment, what kinds of prayers are we offering to God as a church? Are they dominated with simply prayers for ourselves and our own needs? Well, without minimizing that in in any way, we must elevate evangelistic prayers in this church. First of all, first of all, evangelistic prayers. We have many pastors and leaders in this room. When we're gathered corporately, I'll urge you, as Paul urged, fill your prayers with evangelistic prayers according to what Paul is saying in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Parents, fill your table prayers with evangelistic concerns. When you're gathering in your small groups, church family, fill your prayers together with evangelistic concerns. These, first of all, prayers. All kinds of prayers for all kinds of people, for all flourishing. In this type of environment, the gospel is going to be displayed and the the gospel can be declared freely. So Paul, he wants to convince us of this, that the church needs to commit itself to evangelistic prayers, to to etch that on, on our own hearts so that our hearts are aligned with God's very heart and his desire. So what he does is he deepens our understanding, not just of the types of prayers we are to offer, but actually deepen our understanding of God's very purposes. Not just our evangelistic prayers, but God's evangelistic purposes in the world because of his own character, who he is, and what he has done in and through his son, Jesus Christ. So we move from our prayers to God's purposes in verses 5 to 7. And what are God's purposes? This one God who is over all, sent his one mediator for all, which is proclaimed in the one message to all. That's what he is teaching us. And that's going to motivate our own prayers and help us to align them with God's very purposes. Just like in our own day, Paul ministered in an age of religious pluralism. And he loudly blasted the trumpet of the Old Testament and the New Testament in the face of this religious pluralism and said, there is one God, not many. There's only one God who's worthy of our praise. There's only one God who is deserving of our obedience. And there is only one God who is the true King of kings. There's no other God to turn to for help. There's no other God willing to help except the one God of the Bible. And thanks be to God who is over all things that his purposes are to send the one mediator who can bring us salvation. The one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Holy Spirit, and we see the eternal purposes of this triune God on display. As Paul taught earlier, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. God the Father sent God the Son into the world to save sinners by becoming a mediator and by becoming a ransom. He's a mediator between God and man. He took on human flesh, becoming one of us. He's a mediator bridging the gap, bringing reconciliation between us and God, the perfect holy God and a sinful, unholy people. And how did he do that? He did that by giving his very life in the place of sinners. The perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, took on human flesh to bear our sins as a substitute for us. He tasted death in our place. He paid the ransom price for death to free us from our enslavement to sin and give us an eternal hope. And he did this For all. That word's repeated all throughout this passage. All people, all people, all kinds of people. This one God is a global God. 
And this one mediator is a global mediator. God's purposes for our salvation worked out through the one mediator, Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to say that this is the testimony or the witness. This is, this is evidence in a sense of God's heart and desire to save all. He even says in verse 7 that, that he's been appointed by God to carry on this message to all, even to the Gentiles. One message of salvation, one mediator, Jesus Christ, one God over all. I wonder tonight, do you know this God, this one God, through this one mediator who gives us salvation and freedom from our enslavement to sin? It doesn't matter what kind of person you are tonight, salvation, forgiveness, and freedom from the penalty of sin and a hope for all eternity is available and is offered to all. Every person in this room, it is available, it is offered to all. Those blessings, those benefits can be received as you know the gospel of Jesus Christ and receive it by faith, that Christ came to die for sinners and pay the ransom for us that we could not pay so that we could know eternal life. So if you confess your sin to the only God, you ask for mercy from the only God, and you trust in the one mediator, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, salvation is yours. Would you receive that tonight? The evangelistic prayers of the church The evangelistic purposes of God, we see that offered even tonight. And I wonder if you've received that message already. Don't you want others? (laughs) Don't you want others to know this one God? To receive the one mediator so that they can know the freedom from enslavement to sin? Then let's get after evangelistic prayers. Let's get after evangelistic speaking so that all kinds of people might come to know the one God. So we want to be a healthy church here at College Church. For the long haul, we need to align our prayers with God's purposes. Evangelistic prayers aligned with God's evangelistic heart and evangelistic purposes in the world. Jesus prayed, and his identity was revealed to many. Anna in Luke 2 prayed, the prophetess, even to 84 years old, that the Messiah would arrive, and he finally arrived and brought redemption to the people of God. The early church prayed, and the Spirit came. The early church prayed, and the message went out. The early church prayed, and Gentiles received the gospel. The early church prayed and missionaries were sent out to the nations. The church fathers followed up the apostles and they prayed. Clement, Polycarp, many others, Calvin, Luther, and the reformers, many others. Over the centuries, God's church has aligned its prayers with God's purposes and the gospel has been going out and people, all kinds of people have been coming to know Jesus Christ. I wonder, I wonder what what Wheaton would look like in the next year or five years, the next 50 years, if this church body devoted itself to evangelistic, earnest prayers. What would this community look like as we pray for the leaders that are in our community here in Wheaton and in Illinois? What type of environment, a flourishing environment would be cultivated so that we could live godly lives that would actually uh, cause people to ask us for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, leading to gospel speaking? What would Wheaton look like? I wonder what people would start to come to faith on the heels of our commitment to evangelistic prayers. What leaders in Wheaton What children in our community? What refugees in our community? What stars or those with a disability in our community? What women? What men? What socioeconomic backgrounds? 
what racial and ethnic backgrounds, what people would come to know Jesus as their Savior on the heels of the evangelistic prayers of college church? Brothers and sisters, let's align our prayers with God's purposes for His glory and the advancement of the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we seek you tonight. We thank you that you instruct us and guide us. And we long to be a praying people with evangelistic fervor and concern that our own heartbeat would match your heartbeat, that we would pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people so that we would live in a certain way, in a certain environment where the gospel can be freely and openly proclaimed and many would come to faith. We long for that and we pray for that in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.